My name is Michael Poffer, and today I'm going to be presenting on microbubble technology for wound care and health applications. This is a collaborative effort between myself, Dr. Widgerow uh, in the Department of Surgery, and Dr. Mark Bachman in the Department of Electrical Engineering. So after this presentation, I hope you look at a glass of water you pour a little bit differently. There's some stuff that you may have seen all these years and never thought of anything of it that has some very powerful biomedical applications. So in this presentation, I'm going to be discussing wound care and some current challenges with this. The role of oxygen in, in wound healing, some current advanced wound care technology, uh, the properties of micro and nano bubbles, micro bubble generation systems, some biomedical applications for this technology, and preliminary results of uh, some studies in this work, and then conclusions from this research. So first I want to start with a little bit of a, a nasty topic here, burns. Burns are, um, are particularly bad in the sense that they're, they're a tricky wound to try and treat. And up to about 100 years ago, uh, there was no real good treatment. Physicians would just slather on grease or honey onto the burn wound and say some prayers, push the patient off to the side, maybe wrap it in gauze. And if they lived, they lived. If they died, they died. And that was about all they could do. And over the last 100 years, and especially in the last 20 years, a lot of new technology has come out. The same thing is true for chronic wounds. This is a picture of a diabetic uh, foot ulcer here. Uh, these can become uh, complicated wounds. So they can start as something that's simple and they can become a persistent wound that's very hard to treat. And the treatment of these kind of injuries is very empirical. If you go to the cardiologist and the cardiologist puts a heart valve in you and that heart valve doesn't work, uh, you're going to be calling your lawyer. But with burn wounds and, and chronic wounds like this, there's a lot of empirical uh, treatment that's associated with it. Some methods might not work, and you have to go back, and they keep trying new methods until something works. So it's not a sound science. But burn wounds especially are tricky to deal with. And this graphic illustrates it. You can see here that at about 40% um, mortality and about 60% of uh, burn wounds. So this is basically your back and your legs. So with that being covered with a burn, you have a 40% chance of dying. That's pretty high. And most communicable diseases, if you had a 40% chance of dying from it, there would be a lot of front page news around here, but there's a lot of complacency about burns and burn injuries. And a lot of people don't know how uh, challenging this really is uh, as an issue for, uh, for, medical, uh, for medical science. So burn wounds can kill you through one of two methods commonly. The first is through a shock or, or a, a upsetting of homeostasis. And then secondarily, the second curve you see here is the remaining patients who get through the first piece of the, the problem then can succumb to either sepsis, which is blood poisoning, or uh, infection that spreads and uh, turns gangrenous or uh, other issues in that way. Basically, um, infection is a, is a remaining issue. It's a big problem still burn wounds. So dressings for, bur or dressings for all wounds are similar to the, the way they were 3,000 years ago. Yes, now that we have germ theory, we understand that cleanliness is godliness as far as treating injuries. We know that sterility and, and cleaning uh, the wounds is important. But other than that, as far as general clinical practice, I'm not talking research, but general, cl general clinical practice, there's not a lot of uh, light years of advancement. You see in this ancient Greek, pottery them, uh, these two assistants wrapping somebody with gauze, and you see this photo of modernly somebody also wrapped with gauze. You're doing basically the same thing. So what really has changed between this? One thing is we're beginning now to understand the role of oxygen in um, healing of wounds. So oxygen, immediately you might think anaerobic bacteria. For example, gangrene, gas gangrene is the effect of anaerobic bacteria. So when certain kinds of bacteria that don't require oxygen are kept in situations where they don't get oxygen, they thrive, whereas your body cells don't do very well and they take over. Um, this, is a, this is a problem, and gangrene and um, tetanus are caused by this, and these are serious clinical issues. But this is not the whole story. We know that from, uh, from burn wards, much of the, uh, the infections that are actually problems are, are in the, uh, the genus Pseudomonas. This is an obligate aerobic bacteria. It has to have oxygen to live. So by giving a lot of oxygen, you're helping your body, but you're also helping the bacteria. So this is part of the problem, this, uh, this concept of anaerobic bacteria being able to kill it. But it's not the whole situation. So it turns out that there's actually a, uh, an important mechanism your body has, or your white blood cells have, especially the neutrophils, to be able to fight infections. 
reaction, and that's this process of, of leukocyte oxidase. It's actually um, a cascade. This is one of the, uh, the, the components of it. And from a number of studies, and I cited two up here to discuss, there are actually thresholds that are important as far as the amount of oxygen that needs to enter a wound or be present on a wound and the healing prospect of that wound. So, for example, 40 millimeters of mercury partial pressure is what's necessary to heal a leg wound. And this right down here states that once you get to about 30 millimeters of mercury partial pressure, the effect starts dropping off dramatically. So if you take a wound and you take it away from oxygen, and these neutrophils can't get the oxygen they need to, to create the reactive species to be able to fight bacteria, you start getting in a situation where wounds don't heal very well. Now also, oxygen and the reactive species from it trigger uh, fibroblast activity for the rebuilding of a wound site. So it's not just the, um, the killing of the bacteria, but it's also part of the next process in remodeling the area for regrowth of the, the epithelium back um, again over the, uh, the, the wound site. So people have addressed this, and there's studies going back to the 60s on this, where they've taken um, people with wounds and placed them in hyperbaric oxygen. This is either, either hyperbaric oxygen or hyperbaric air. You take the person, you place them in either their, their entire body or just their head um, in oxygen of high pressure. And uh, what will happen is um, you can get some uh, interesting effects here. So if you remember those numbers we talked about before, this is cited from another study if we take air and we put um, air to the wound site, just, just put air over the top of the wound site, you can get to about 67, 63 um, millimeters of mercury, mercury partial pressure. We said that 40 was necessary for it to start moving. So you're above that, that necessary level, but you're not exceeding it. You're not doing extremely well. And there is a, uh, that's just the minimum, the bare minimum to get by. If you put pure oxygen at atmospheric pressure, right here, on the wound site, you can get up to these much, much higher values. And this actually has a beneficial effect. In fact, from the same study, uh, one of the, the pieces of the study was that uh, two hours of, of transcutaneous, or just oxygen placed on top of the wound, can lead to a 54% uh, decrease in post-operative infection. So it does have a positive effect. Now, some of you that have cultured cells may wonder that if, if you culture cells, what's the problem with uh, oxygen toxicity? I know that we culture cells at atmospheric. Why don't we culture cells at, at higher pressures? And that's because of oxygen toxicity. And if any of you are divers, you know why it's not a wise idea to, stripe, to strap an oxygen tank to your back and go scuba diving with it. Because at higher pressures, you can likely succumb, uh, succumb to oxygen toxicity. And on a systemic level, that can be fatal and cause seizures. So oxygen, you can get too much of a good thing. But let's take a step back and look at this um, in a broader perspective. We know that the cell growth, and this is now cited from a different study here, that as you continue to increase the oxygen concentration, the time that it takes for cells to double start increasing. And there's some happy uh, medium right here. Once you get hypoxic, the, the level starts decreasing. So there is a sweet spot somewhere between 80 and 160 millimeters of mercury, which is about atmospheric pressure. So as long as you can provide this to a wound, somewhere in that, in that range, you can help the reactive oxygen species kill bacteria through the neutrophils, and you can also um, help the cells grow in the area. So how do you give moderated amounts of oxygen to the wound site? So here are two pictures of dressings that are commonly used for burn wounds in clinic right now. This is an isolation dressing. It's basically saran wrap. Saran wrap is placed over the top to be able to isolate um, stuff in the environment from getting on the burn wound. But what do you guys know about saran wrap and oxygen? Why do you use it in the fridge to cover stuff up? It blocks the oxygen out. Some does get through, but it greatly reduces it. Another one is a, is a wet dressing. This is basically a wet piece of um, saline soaked gauze that's placed under um, more gauze that's dry. And as it dries, it sucks the exudate or the, the ooze that comes out of the wound. And, um, and helps kind of keep the wound clean, but it also prevents the oxygen from getting to the wound site. So these clinically accepted commonplace dressings are actually limiting one of these big factors that are associated with wound healing. It seems kind of counterproductive. So there's a new technology that's coming out there right now called negative pressure wound therapy. And what this is, is a system that sits on top of the wound and it has suction. This suction, pulls fluid from inside the body through the wound and out and into a collection system. Here's an example of a place.
place. These are patches that are placed on top of the wound, and this is the collection system right here. If you remember back a couple slides ago when I showed this chart here, what is the amount of oxygen that's present subcutaneously? 40 milligrams of, of mercury partial pressure. What did I say the minimum was? 40 milligrams of partial pressure. You're right at that same threshold. You're basically helping the situation, but you're not helping it fantastically. There, there is great interest in this technology, but it doesn't solve the oxygen problem. It solves some of the infection problem because you're clearing the wound site and uh, the cleanliness issue, but it doesn't solve the oxygen problem. So is there an approach to be able to deal with the oxygen problem, to be able to deliver oxygen right into the dressings? And there is. And this is the technology we're working on. And this is uh, microbubble and nanobubble technology. So you've all seen microbubbles at some point and probably have never thought of a single thing of them. So I brought a little couple of quick things just to show you guys. This is just water in a container. If I shake this up, the bubbles go right to the surface and there's almost nothing left behind. These are macro bubbles. These bubbles are greater than 50 microns in size. And what happens is as the shaking stops, they raise to the surface and they pop right at the surface. But bubbles that are less than 50 microns in size don't pop. What they do is they actually shrink and they disappear. If you look under a microscope, you see a bubble and it just goes, and it's gone. Just in the solution. It doesn't raise to the top, it's just in the solution. It just hangs out there and disappears. In fact, it doesn't actually disappear. It gets to a point where it gets so small, it converts to something called a nano bubble. And a nano bubble is about three to 500 microns in size. They're bubbles that are charge stabilized of, of air that persist in solution for a length of time. So the, the appearance of, of micro bubble solution is cloudy. The nano bubble becomes uh, almost transparent again. This is what micro bubbles look like when they're in solution. They're this very cloudy um, stuff that's on top. This picture is generated using a shower head. There's particular interest in this technology, especially in Korea and Japan. There's a number of uh, cosmetic products made out of uh, shower heads, pet wash systems that use this technology. And this is generated using one of these shower heads. It's called a Loni shower head. And what will happen is after a period of time, the micro bubbles will, they're not really flow, they are moving upwards, but actually what's happening is the process is starting uh, to go faster under higher pressure at the bottom to the conversion of, of um, nano bubbles. So this technology is relatively new. Over the last 10 years, this is just a literature search done with um, a web of science. You can see that over the last 10 years, there's just been an extremely increasing um, interest in, in this technology based upon the number of citations and the number of papers that are written. So um, what, what's so interesting about these bubbles? So one thing that's kind of cool is if you if you imagine having a, a sphere of gas and that sphere will become pressed inwards, what's happening is the gas in there is, is being placed under pressure. You guys all remember this Laplace relationship from, um, from your uh, fluid dynamics classes. So we know that the surface tension here is related to the pressure here where the diameter shrinks. So there's a hyperbolic relationship. As the diameter decreases, the pressure goes up hyperbolic. But there is a balance here. There's actually negative charges on the outside of these bubbles. As the bubbles get smaller, these negative charges repel against each other. So it's not just the pressure of the gas, but it's also the charges that keep the bubbles from shrinking to, to absolutely nothing. So what happens is these bubbles shrink down and there becomes a stability point at about three to 500 uh, nanometers, which is where they, they continue to persist as, as narrow bubbles. Now, as they shrink, what happens is the pressure is increasing inside them, and also the diameter is decreasing. So N, which is the molar transfer rate of gas, is increasing also. So you can use these bubbles to push tremendous amounts of gas into the solution. So there's, there's two main types of microbubble generators that are out there commercially. These are, these are two diagrams from two Japanese companies that make these things. There's no American companies that I know of that produce these. One is called the dissolved oxygen type, which basically takes water and air and pushes it under high pressure into a little tank. After a period of time, the air and the water dissolve into each other, and it's forced through a nozzle, and the cavitation in the nozzle, or the turbulence there, causes the microbubbles to drop out of solution. Once the microbubbles drop out of solution, they become present in the water. The other way is to use something called a vortex. Here, water is pushed in, and gas is also pushed in, and the turbulence within the system breaks up the bubbles into tiny, tiny uh, little microbubbles. But because, as you know, the Reynolds numbers drop at small scales, this needs to have high fluid rate, and it needs to be 
rather large in size. So this doesn't work well for a medical device. This is like a shower head where you have big amounts of water. Unless you're trying to pump tons of water through, you end up with problems. So what we've been investigating is using a gear pump. And this is a technology we uh, have been uh, looking at. Gear pumps are a special kind of pump that take water and use these rotating gears to be able to push them from the low pressure side around the outside to the high pressure side. But there's leakage in the system. This is an idealized model. In reality, air and water that are injected together, there's an air inlet here, go through this pump and they become chopped up. And there's all these little leakage points around the outside over the tops of the gears. They're being pressurized and also cut up at the same time. And what this does is this leads to microbubble formation. Once this high pressure water goes through the nozzle, the remaining um, dissolved oxygen, the dissolved air, releases from the bubbles and goes into solution and you generate um, microbubbles. Here's a video of this process taking place. Just to show you how dramatic this is. This is the little gear pump right here, and the tubes go in here, and the nozzle is right here. Now you're probably wondering why this is the kitchen. Well, it turns out microbubbles have a bizarre effect, and you guys have all seen this when you drink soda. You know that that soda tastes kind of almost spicy. The microbubbles popping on your taste buds causes the sensation of spiciness. So it turns out you can make very bizarre mixed drinks with this. So if anyone is a mixologist, let's talk afterwards. <laughs> it tastes really interesting. So. Going back to this, the, the biomedical application, or just back to that video for a second there, you saw that those bubbles persist. Even after the bubbles are persisting in solution and they finally disappear, nanobubbles still live on afterwards. This was that thing I just shook up, and this was where I ran that generator a day ago. If I shan the laser through here, you can see no scatter in the first one, a lot of scatter in the second one. That's because the, the, the uh, nanobubbles that are still present in here, they can live on for weeks or months at a time, are still there scattering the laser. Though those little bubbles, you can't see them, but they're there scattering the laser. So what we know is that the solubility of oxygen um, increases uh, with decreasing temperature. But what happens is there's a set level, let me skip this slide in the interest of time, there's a set level of the saturation of oxygen that can go into water at a given time. So what happens is, you can't, if you shook this jar up, that first jar that I'm showing you many, many times, you can't go over a certain threshold. But what happens is when you use the micro bubble system, you can actually supercharge the water above the threshold it's supposed to be. So I can get a 24% increase in oxygen concentration in the solution. In fact, if you take this to the next level and push oxygen micro bubbles, not just air, but oxygen micro bubbles, they will actually act as reservoirs and continue to hold the oxygen in the solution. I skip that slide here for a second. So in evaluating the bubbles themselves, we push them through a particle counter, and you can see that the majority of the bubbles generated with our system sit at about 25 microns in size. And what's interesting is you can actually see that if you are running a particle counter while the system is running, the bubbles are persisting over here at 25 microns. But once you turn the generator off and wait a few minutes, the level starts dropping, and now you get a huge number of bubbles persisting at the, the 10 microns of below side, because those bubbles are in the process of converting to nanobubbles. So how do we apply this for a biomedical application? So in the collaboration, one of my first projects was creating a soft, flexible uh, patch that goes on burn wounds to be able to collect exudate for analysis. So using um, uh, some special processes, we made these very thin patches that can go on top of burn wounds and be used in the clinic. This technology, um, this is just an image of, of this same device I'm showing you right now. It's laminated with multiple thin membranes. We have this special process to produce these thin membranes because it's difficult to produce these with uh, silicone using conventional soft lithography processes. This right now is in clinical trials, and we, we can't keep these things on the shelf. As the burn wound uh, uh, patients are showing up, these have been going into the clinic and being used on them. So I'm uh, working full time just making these devices for, for this follow-up study. But, the modification of this device can be used to not only collect exudate from, and by the way, we're not just sticking on random patients, we have an IRB for this. So we have permission to do this. They're informed consent. So the next, the next piece of the puzzle is now to try and take this same system that we have and make it so it not only collects, but also gives out. So by piping in the micro bubble solution to the burn wound and then collecting it, you can pass it over the burn wound and oxygenate the wound while it's healing. And this is a diagram of what this system would look like. We're currently working on this. I'm about a week away from, from good results on this. So it's a little preliminary to show you right now what we have. But this is a system 
designer and what it looks like and the engineering requirements. So in conclusion, oxygen has a clear beneficial role for the wound healing process. Microbubbles, we know, can supercharge it, can increase the oxygen content of fluid over what it should be at a given temperature. The microbubbles themselves act like reservoirs and actually hold oxygen in the solution longer than it should. If it were just shook up, you can actually hold it much higher and longer. Um, the final proposed technology would be simple, portable, and low cost. That little pump I showed you is about this big. This can be turned into a small system that's self-contained that can be used in developed and developing countries alike. It's a small, low-cost system. The gear pump itself is $40, but there's no reason why the motor and all the other parts can't be separated in a, in a uh, changeable cartridge with the gears that's a couple dollars be used to generate the micro bulbs. There's no reason why this can't be the case. And then there's also broad-reaching applications for this technology uh, here and also in industry. This is being used right now in Japan exclusively for, uh, or extensively, for aquaculture. They use this to help shrimp and uh, abalone uh, in in polluted waters, and also to clean up wastewater. So this is a very interesting, interesting technology, and you're likely to see a lot more of it, not just from our group, but other groups out there in the near future. Thank you very much.